Welcome. I'm Audrey Stewart. I'm the volunteer coordinator for Austin Waters Wildland Conservation Division. So this Woody Plants webinar is the second in our series of Falcones Canyonlands Preserves uh, Forest Restoration Training Series. So for those of you who are new to the BCP, the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve is a more than 32,000 acre system of preserves that provides an umbrella of protection for two neotropical migratory songbirds, the endangered golden cheek warbler and the rare black cap vireo, six cave dwelling invertebrates and 27 species of concern. By mitigating for development of endangered species habitat, the BCP allows the city to grow and prosper in ways that protect our most sensitive species and our valuable green infrastructure. We have an amazing community of volunteers. I see many of their names here with us today. Um, and they monitor species, they restore habitat, uh, share the preserve with others. So thanks to all of our volunteers um, and welcome to new folks. So for those of you who don't know Jim O'Donnell and for those who do, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Jim and then turn it over to him for a presentation on designing for placement, function and diversity. For over 30 years, Jim has combined his love of teaching biology and environmental stewardship to help protect the black cap vireo and endangered golden cheek warbler in Central Texas. He taught science and environmental education in Dripping Springs for 28 years. During that time, he was instrumental in setting aside the 214 acre tract of land that is now known as the Vireo Preserve, which once supported the largest concentration of black cap vireos in Travis County. As a result of his efforts and knowledge of the endangered songbirds and their ecosystems, Jim was appointed to the biological advisory team that provided the basis and support for the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, a system of preserves established under a Federal Endangered Species Act permit to protect multiple endangered and rare species in Travis County. After retiring from teaching in 2009, Jim has spent the last 12, 11 years designing and implementing habitat restoration on the Vireo Preserve, which is now owned and managed by the City of Austin as part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Jim uses his knowledge of the species, plants, permaculture, and teaching to implement regenerative habitat restoration projects with a community of volunteers to benefit a variety of native Texas Hill Country ecosystems. He regularly gives presentations on numerous state and local groups and was a presenter at the 2019 Global Earth Repair Conference in Port Townsend, Washington on this topic. Uh, welcome, Jim. All right. Well, thank you so much, Audrey, and welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, this is an exciting thing. I, you know, I, I just this is a, a very fun event, and I really appreciate all the help we're getting to put this together. And thanks for tuning in. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with this. And the first question, as we do restoration work across the BCP, is what is ecological restoration? Uh, well, there's several different definitions of ecological restoration. We'll pick two here. Uh, one is from the Society of Ecological Restoration, and their definition is that it's a process of assisting the recovery and management of ecosystem integrity. Ecological integrity includes a critical range of durability and biodiversity, ecological processes and structures, regional and historical content, and sustainable cultural practices. We did a lot last week on historical content, and we'll touch on it again today. But one that I like and one that kind of goes through my mind as I'm out there walking on the landscape is something from Aldo Leopold who says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Last time we talked a little bit about the BCP Forest Woodland Restoration Goals and our goals are pretty simple. We protect prime habitat uh, we enhance systems that are recovering and restore degraded landscapes. So let's take a look at how we do that and what goes into the, the thinking of how to approach a project. It can be a little overwhelming when you're standing in an area that's just all white caliche and you're sort of told or, or it's implied that we need to make a old growth forest out of this that will support golden cheek warblers. Well, it probably won't happen in our lifetime, but we can certainly start the process. And the process is started by first observation. Walking and sitting on the site, know where things are and how they interact with the surroundings. How does energy flow across the system and what's working and what's not working? Observation can take quite some time. And sometimes I have projects that I've been looking at for a couple of years. And and if, I, if you have that advantage to be able to do that, you don't have a time frame. You can watch how water flows across the system. You can be out there in the summertime when it's hot on this slope. 
You can be out there in the winter and deal with the winds that come across these areas. So observation is an extremely important uh, concept here. Visioning is another uh, aspect here. Uh, we should, uh, what should the design do? You know, uh, what are we trying to accomplish with what we're going to do? How does the design benefit the surrounding communities? We'll be talking about that here shortly. Each element in the design should have multiple purposes. Researching then comes into it and uh, historical impacts. It's great to look at why the land looks the way it does. What's the historical implications? Uh, what was happening on this landscape 60 years ago? Uh, soil conditions are a result of what was happening 60 years ago. Uh, species inventory, what's there, what's not there? Identifying functioning uh, ecosystems and non-functioning ecosystems. Uh, planning then rolls into the scenario here. How is energy captured and stored across the landscape? What elements are missing? And how can we use existing patterns, perhaps contours and shapes on the uh, landscape? But sometimes it's prioritizing actions. Uh, we call it ecological triage. We can't hit everything. So the thing that we're going to focus on first is the stuff that really needs immediate attention. Things like eroded areas, head cuts, things like that that will continue to degrade uh, and degrade rapidly in heavy rainstorm events. Then we're looking at development and implement, implementation. Uh, so that's logistics, resources, putting things in the phases and the timelines. How much is this project gonna cost? Uh, many times consultants do this type of work and they have a limited budget and they have a limited amount of time. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, monitoring the next thing and maintenance are sacrificed. We at the city have, have the advantage of being able to monitor these over a long period of time and maintenance is like incredibly important. Uh, I don't know how many times I've seen restoration projects where people had worthy goals. They went in there and they planted a whole bunch of trees. They even caged them and then they walked away and then you see these cages, you know, years later and there's nothing in those cages. So maintenance on these projects can go on for two, five, 10 years of maintenance to make sure that everything is functioning the way it should. So let's begin with looking at some historical impacts. This is the Vireo Preserve in 1940. Now keeping in mind, it looks pretty wooded, but this is after 70 years of the cedar chopping going on in the area. And William Bray had passed through this area. He was a U.S. forester and in 1904. And he warned, and let's see if this works down here. These slopes down here, he actually walked and photographed in this area. And he warned um, the state of Texas at the time that if we keep cutting our trees, especially on these steep slopes, we're gonna have erosion problems and soil loss. He even proposed to the state of Texas to purchase land uh, to protect woodlands, especially from the cattle industry that was real prominent in the day. By 1958, this was the Vireo Preserve, or part of it. And what happened here, the scorched earth look here, was uh, there was a, a rancher who came in and wanted to make a cattle ranch out of it. And her name was Osceola Davenport, and she was South Texas oil money, and uh, came in and bought 1,200 acres in the area and wanted to make a working cattle ranch out of it. Uh, landowners in the area discouraged her from doing that by saying, no, keep your cattle down by the river. It's kind of where they're safe. It's too hard to find them in the canyons. But she was determined to turn this uh, woodland forest area uh, into a rangeland. And she set aside doing that. You can see, for those of you who work with me out at the Vireo Preserve, this is the second knoll. You'll notice here that she left this little pocket here uh, on the north side, and then a pocket of trees on the east side. These are, I won't call it old growth, but older growth juniper trees that are several hundred years old. And that's where our golden cheek warblers are. Uh, so those were left and but the rest of it, you can well imagine, you don't even have to have much of an imagination to imagine the soil loss here. Uh, the 1950s, despite being a time of drought, 
was also a time of heavy rain. Uh, and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, but just as an example, the year before in 1957, we had 51 inches of rain here in the Austin area. So you can well imagine all of the soil retreating down off of these slopes. And, and the shallow soils that we have today are in part a result of this. Now you'll notice these three, uh, three red bars here. Uh, for those of you who work out there, that's our Berman Swale Project. This is our effort to reforest this area. And you can see it's just above the golden cheek warbler habitat, the old growth stuff. This area, and you'll see a picture of it here in a second, has remained a fairly eroded uh, spot, not much growing in that spot. Uh, observation has shown me that over the years, not much grows in that spot. So we wanted to make a change. So, so the Bioswale Project, we started this last year, October of 2019. And if you look at the soils here, you can see that they're pretty compacted. Uh, we have the advantage here of being on a north facing slope. Uh, so it's not quite as harsh on this side as it is on the south and southwest facing slopes. But still in October, you can see that the grasses are fairly brown, things are eking out a living. So I'm asking, okay, so what's working here? There's a lot that's not working. This little oak grove back here in the back is working. And in that area, soil is being created and there's cover uh, for plants uh, coming up. Uh, and we'll talk more about the benefits of these little groves of trees here in a second. But uh, this has a gentle slope. Uh, there is subsoil here and we could dig in it. Um, you know, we kind of dug down to see just how difficult this was going to be to to dig on contour here. And this is September of this year after a rain. And what we did here uh, is, we, is we dug a berm here and a swale here. This is about seven, eight feet across. And, this, and the berm is about seven, eight feet across. And this is on contour. So when it rains, all of this water soaks in, plumes in to the berm here. Now we've got water in the system. Uh, we have soil that's mounded up and we need to begin enriching that soil. And we did that with some compost and this area is heavily mulched. And we'll talk about the importance of that in a second. But more important right now is we had a lot of diversity of trees that we put in here. Uh, a lot of these trees uh, are trees that are gonna do well in uh, uh, exposed environments. Uh, we don't have um, forest trees necessarily in this just yet until we get some trees that grow up and give it some shade. Um, but uh, it's coming along beautifully. And if you have a chance, you need to come out and see this. It's, there's quite a difference between this year and last year. Okay, so to get a functioning ecosystem going, you need certain ingredients. And all of these are extremely important. When you go into these caliche areas, I always think of BOWS, B-O-W-S, and B being biomass. We need to create a system of biomass in this area. And that comes, the biomass comes from trees and shrubs and vines, herbaceous plants, grasses, mulch, sticks, anything that will cover that surface. The great sin in restoration is leaving bare ground. So we need something that's covering that ground. And then down in the soil, we need to begin soil organic matter. And that can be small plant residue. It could be roots of even things like uh, annual plants that have died back. At least there's some roots, there's some organic matter in that soil. Uh, soil organisms that are decomposing organic matter and, and eventually getting something that's fairly stable like some humus uh, in the soil as well. Um, water as we just saw is extremely important, but water is only valuable if water stays on the landscape. If it soaks into the soil, a soil sponge, and that means improving the soil quality, uh, it's valuable. If it's compacted soil, like a lot of times that when there's no vegetation on the soil, the soil hardens up, it becomes hard pan, and we can have a 10 inch rainfall and all of that just runs off like, like it would off a concrete. So we can have, you know, uh, 
you know, a lot of rain and then have a drought a week later on that soil because it's just not, nothing was absorbed. And uh, then we add lots of uh, diversity into the system. Uh, diversity creates diversity. And so you have a diversity of plants, you get a diversity of insects, a diversity of microorganisms, and we'll talk more about that as we go here as well. We're gonna cover a lot of soil in our soil biology uh, session in a couple of months. The art of placement. Placement is extremely valuable in restoration work. Um, you know, I've been a part when I was teaching of a lot of projects in which it feels good to go out and plant a tree out in an open field and then it dies because, well, nobody's watering it, but also it's exposed out there uh, with, with no cover. So placement is extremely important. So we're looking at aspect. We wanna know the direction of, you know, if we're planting on a southwest facing slope, we better be prepared for a really hot summer. And uh, that's going to dry out those plants. So we need plants that can have some cover. So aspect's always important. North side is a little bit more protection. East side, we can oftentimes get morning sun and afternoon shade. Um, the sun is going to change the angle daily as, you know, morning sun versus afternoon sun. Uh, planting in the area that uh, only gets afternoon sun is not really advisable. Seasonal movements, summertime, we got sun more overhead. In winter, it's more at a lower angle in the sky. Uh, the time, uh, shade is extremely important. Again, it's time of day with that. Uh, uh, you could kind of go into an area and you think, well, it's, this is a great place to plant a tree. It's shady, but in the afternoon, it's not. Uh, wind can be seasonally, uh, seasonal. Um, in the summertime, predominantly it's coming out of the southeast. And in the wintertime, lots of times we're getting a strong north wind, something to consider when you're doing your planting. Uh, slope is real important. How is that water gonna move across the slope? Uh, we work with key points on slopes to capture water. We'll be talking more about that as well. And how does water move across the landscape? You know. It's one of the most valuable times to go out for a walk is in the rain, because if you can follow the water on the landscape, maybe not when it's lightning, but, but when it's, if it's just raining, you can walk the water and then figure out how to bank it. Okay, where is this water going? Is it soaking in? How do I capture this? How do I get it to slow down water movement? Uh, soils, noting that condition of the soil. If it's hard pan soil, that water's just gonna run across it. How do we fix that soil? And plants, plants have a story. They'll tell you a story. They'll tell you what's going on there. And let's listen to a plant story. This is a Quercus buckleyi story. Look at this poor Quercus buckleyi. He's on a southwest facing slope. And at one time where he is situated there, at one time uh, there was a woodland. And this Quercus buckleyi represents several remaining Texas red oaks, is the common name, on a southwest facing slope. Due to extensive clear cutting in the 1950s and heavy rain events, it lost its topsoil. For example, in 1957, like I mentioned earlier, there was 51 inches of rain, but that was for the year, but we had some heavy rain events. So like in April of that year, it was almost 10 inches of rain in April. In May of that year, 7.3. In June of that year, see this heavy rain pattern continuing, five inches of rain. And then October, 8.7 inches of rain. So that's 1957, the year before, that picture that uh, you saw before the 1958 picture. And this was cleared before 1958, but you can well imagine that that rain having an impact on that landscape. So Quercus buckleyi is normally an understory oak, and now it's exposed out there. So the remaining soil became compacted during the drought. And then a fire in 1961 on the Vireo Preserve that was fueled by hundreds of brush piles from the clear cutting uh, burn the area. Without protection from other canopy species, the red oaks suffer from heat stress. Uh, they are only able to survive due to the understory plants giving them some covers. 
So you can see the oaks kind of coming back up in here, but this understory gives them protection. And they get this protection courtesy of the birds that sit up in these dead limbs and drop the seed. So these are not healthy specimens, these Texas red oaks, and they're telling me, don't you plant any more Texas red oaks in this area. Well, we haven't planted any there, but it's one of the trees that we wouldn't put there. So on this slope, we're putting trees that are really drought hardy because of the southwest facing slope. Things like we have kidney wood in there, we have some resatch in there, we have mimosa borealis in there, the fragrant sumac, uh, latama is in there, and that's just to give us that biomass until we can reestablish other plants. Okay, so living on the edge, you know, a lot of uh, places on our preserve have these little tiny little juniper thickets. And a thicket is an opportunity for us because juniper thickets and degraded areas provide shade, they build soil, that's where the soil is, not the 50 feet away where the caliche is. Uh, they provide wind protection, they provide shelter and food for wildlife, moisture and erosion control. There's lower temperatures in there. I've taken soil temperatures where it's 87 degrees in this, and then I go 50 feet over into the caliche on a day that's 100 degrees and it's 120 degrees on that caliche. Uh, so we have lower temperatures in these little thickets. So they're a nursery for tree planting and seeding. Also, we can expand out from these guys. We start planting on the edge. And you can see this little oak that I didn't plant, but some squirrel did or a jay or something, and it's getting a start. Successional stages. I think everybody has seen this, but what's important here is in these in the annual weedy areas, the pioneer plants here play an important role, and these areas are bacteria-dominated soils. As the soils become more, and the plant community becomes more complex, and we move into perennial uh, and, uh, and mid-season type grasses, uh, we start picking up a, more, a little more fungus, uh, and then shrub areas, it's almost a one-to-one -one uh, fungus bacterial uh, relationship or ratio. And then as we get into the woodlands, it becomes much more fungal. So successional stages, this is courtesy of Dr. Elaine Ingham, who is a soil scientist. Um, I recommend taking a look at some of her uh, YouTube videos. She, um, she, outlines it like this, if we have, here's our plant community and here's our fungi bacteria uh, re, uh, ratio, and you can see pioneer plants, uh, the fungus is pretty low, okay? Uh, early grasses, <laughs> excuse me, like KR, KR does really well in disturbed areas and kind of bacterial dominated or almost no bacteria. And they'll, uh, and so they're, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.6 to one. Then you can see as we start getting into grasses, uh, mid and late uh, successional grasses like uh, little blue stem and others, we're almost getting to a one to one ratio. Fungus is starting to increase in the soil. And once we start getting a shrub community going along with native grasses, we can have you know four to 10 um, to, to one ratios of fungi and bacteria. And then as the deciduous trees come up, we are going 10 to 100, then conifer trees, we really um, start getting that fungal bacteria ratio quite, uh, quite high for fungus. So planting a tree, you're kind of thinking, okay, am I planting this in a caliche area that, that's basically bacterial dominated? It's gonna struggle a lot. It may do okay, it's gonna need a little extra care, and it needs at some point to make mycorrhizal connections and the fungus types uh, connections. And uh, so it's gonna need a little extra care, but we have to reestablish it somehow. So, so if we just look at a, the landscape here, we can kind of go, okay, this area next to the road or path is you know, not much going on here. It's pretty caliche, that's gonna be bacterial dominated. We move over here where we have some shrubs and some grasses. Well, we're starting to get into a more fungal bacterial area. Uh, bacteria area and so this is where I might start some trees going over here because at least there's some fungus in the soil to start working and then it expand out from there and then over here you've got a, a woodland that's fungal dominated and perfect for planting trees in here so oops 
Okay, components of forest diversity. Uh, when we start looking at diversity, many times people only look at diversity from one angle. They think, well, how many plants do you have? Well, that's part of it. Compositional diversity is part of uh, forest diversity, but there's also structural diversity and functional diversity. Compositional diversity, that's the one that most people are familiar with. It's all the living and non-living components of an ecosystem. I like this from Aldo Leopold, who says the first rule in intelligent tinkering is to keep all the parts. So, you know, we go in there, we kind of go, ah, let's don't start cutting out all this stuff. Let's let's see what it's what it's going to do for us. So, compositional diversity is who is home and who is missing. You know, it's amazing to me sometimes on these going to different sites on our preserves you'll find that, oh, this is like a really common plant here, but it's not over on this other area. Why would that be? Some of it's just missing. Uh, some of it's just because of past land use. It got uh, either grazed out. For example, at the Greenville Preserve, there wasn't any Turks cap along the waterways there, along the creek, or inland sea oats. And you kind of go, that's, so, that's a common plant. It should be there, so we put it there, and now it's working. So adding diversity into that system. A simplified system is a degraded system. Oftentimes in walking on our preserves, it may be like a monoculture of just juniper trees, where we call them sometimes stick forests. That is a degraded system. Uh, it's lacking diversity. Uh, it may be working and have some fungus uh, rolling in there, but what we would need to do there to really get that system cranked up is add diversity into that system. First, uh, uh, mic uh, micro um, microbiology, and uh, so it's real important, and we're going to talk a lot about this uh, when we talk about soils, but having the soil rich in um, micro life is, is so incredibly important. It's, it builds the structure of soil, it holds the water, and all of those types of things. And a new concept here maybe for you is quorum sensing. Uh, Quorum sensing is, is an important concept in soil biology, and it kind of helps uh, create a functional system. So diverse plant communities support diverse soil microbiomes. The more diverse you have, uh, the more diversity you have, the more possibilities you have. In the microbial world, quorums refer to density-dependent behavior that regulate gene expression in the microbial community. If they don't have a quorum, they can't do their work. They use quorum sensing to collectively coordinate behavior and achieve certain outcomes. Microbes can't see or hear or speak, but they communicate with each other extremely well and they are incredibly well organized. And this is from Dr. Christine Jones, who is an Australian soil scientist. And the way to look at this is, you know, we, we are familiar with the term quorum, that we need a quorum before we can do a certain action. But the more, the more organisms you have in this quorum, the more efficient and the more effective uh, the action's going to be. For example, let's just take the Vireo Preserve. So when I have two volunteers out there, we're gonna be able to do some stuff, but we're not gonna be near as effective as we're gonna be when we have 10 people out there. 10 people are going to bring diversity and creativity, labor, all of these things, that's a quorum. So the more you have in your quorum, the more um, efficient the system's going to run. And this is referring to soil microorganisms. So the soil microorganisms that are around roots, for example, the more diverse, the more they can ach uh, achieve and actually change and turn on, turn on and off genes. So that's what's referred to as when a quorum is reached, the lights come on. It improves things like plant vigor, protects against pests and diseases, uh, protects against drought, frost, and nutrient deficiency. There was a study done in 2012, I think it was, the American Gut Project. And it found that Americans who eat 30 different plant varieties a week have healthier gut microbiome than people who only eat 10. Now that's quite a challenge, you know, to take 30 different types of fruits and vegetables a week 
but it kind of goes back to what I guess mom told us to eat your fruits and vegetables. But 30 a week, you have a more diverse gut a biome, and uh, as a result, it's supposed to make you healthier. So let's look at structural diversity now. That's uh, layers create niches. So in a woodland situation, we're not looking for monoculture of just one particular tree. We want a uh, structural diversity of different types of trees, bushes, and shrubs. So for example, we might design this where we have a canopy layer that's probably already there, could be juniper oaks or cherries or elms. And then just below that, what's just below that? And again, we're looking for that diversity, that quorum, we need to have that soil life come alive and turn the lights on. So just lower than that, we might have things like Carolina buckthorn, dogwood, rusty black haw, a chinook, a Texas ash. And just below that, the shrub layer, well, could be mountain laurel, sumac, yopon. And below that, we start looking at our herbaceous plants like turks caps and bone set and uh, groundsel. Ground cover could be things like dewberries, sedges, cedar sage. And then we have a vertical layer, which are things like Virginia creeper, grapes, and passion vine crawling through there. And then the soil itself, you know, especially in a woodland, we're looking at a fungal dominated system. Could be, you know, we're getting into the mycorrhizal community at that point. And on the trees themselves are endophytes. And one of the interesting things about endophytes, endophytes are a fungus and they live on trees and they, one of the functions that they do is they protect against predators, um, microbial predators. And uh, one of the UT professors brought students out and they were collecting endophytes off of juniper and they found lots of endophytes on juniper more than on most other trees. And they grew them out in a Petri dish. And they were beautiful. It's like, like colorful, you know, star patterns and, and snowflake-like type things with colors. And then they got some oak wilt and they grew that out in a Petri dish. And it was like you might think, it was black and kind of uh, had tentacles coming out. Well, then they decided, what if, we, what if we put the juniper endophytes in with the oak wilt? What might happen? Well, it turns out that the endophytes from the juniper kill the oak wilt. Now, we can't, this is a Petri dish. This isn't something that's out there in nature yet, but it does beg the question of, well, juniper and oaks evolve together. Maybe they need to be together. The importance of understory uh, from an old study back in 1980, uh, canopy trees provide a large amount of biomass, which is extremely important to cover that soil and begin breaking down. And, uh, but the understory vegetation provide the majority of the nutrients for soil microorganisms. And it's because they cycle through faster and oftentimes there's more diversity in the understory than there is in the canopy. Functional diversity, the last one here. Uh, functional diversity is what function do the, these plants play in, in the forest? Well, first off, trees are cooling. Transpiration, the release of moisture from the trees, every gram of moisture release equals seven, I mean, I'm sorry, 600 calories of heat reduction. So when you walk into a woodland, you go, God, it's so much cooler in here. Well, some of it's the shade, but some of it's transpiration because as that trans, uh, evapotranspiration or transpiration is happening, it's actually cooling. Uh, redundancy of functions uh, is a functional diversity type thing. A set of diverse species that perform each function. So for example, we want lots of pollinators in our woodlands. So we want a diverse set of pollinators po uh, pollinating uh, various plants. Nitrogen fixers, we wanna make sure as we're building that soil, we have plenty of nitrogen fixers in that uh, community. So mountain laurel and, and uh, Eve's necklace are, are examples of that. Uh, host species like wafer ash, for example, is a host species for giant swallowtail butterflies. So if we want more giant swallowtail butterflies in our system, wafer ash, telia is a great one for that. And another principle and, and functional diversity is each element performs multiple functions. Now, what comes to mind for me when we're doing restoration work in woodlands is sometimes we'll cut the lower branches, the dead branches off of juniper, and we'll make a, a brush berm. 
small, tight little brush berm uh, that uh, on contour that captures water as it moves down the, the slope. But in that brush berm, we also seed. And uh, so the seed then germinates in a moist environment with some protection. And uh, also it provides shelter for, for lizards and other little, little critters that want to seek shelter in this little brush berm. Okay. And that pretty much concludes my portion of the talk here. And uh, I'll turn it over to Bill now. Great. Thanks, Jim. I'm just going to do a little intro for Bill as Bill gets his presentation up. Um, so Bill has been a City of Austin biologist on the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve since 2006. In addition to monitoring the endangered golden cheek warbler and the rare black cap vireo, he also studies the interactions of the plant and animal communities of the preserve. As one of the preserve's managers, he strives to protect those communities from invasive species and human demands as urban Austin inexorably engulfs the preserve. An avid birder since childhood, Bill moved from Ohio to Austin in 1988. Before taking a position at the city, he worked for the library system at the University of Texas at Austin and at the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. Take it away, Bill. All right, good evening. Wanted to try to uh, cover a little bit about identification of different kinds of trees that you could find on the Balcones Preserve. Uh, I had wanted to go into shrubs and understory trees, but uh, you all would be dizzy by the time we'd be done with this. So I'm going to concentrate on the canopy trees and also the trees that uh, can be confused with them, look-alike trees um, and look-alike shrub in one case. Um, and uh, so try to help you a little bit with uh, learning how to tell different kinds of trees apart. Um, but the best way to tell trees apart is, is not in a video presentation like this. Uh, the best way to tell trees apart is something I'm having trouble, there we go. Um, moving on to um, a references slide. I usually put a reference slide at the end of my presentation, but I wanted to make sure I got it out there soon and hope we can share this with you all after the presentation is over as well. Uh, the best way to learn trees, frankly, is to go out in the field with somebody who already knows them. Um, have them point them out to you. You can walk around a tree, get to know what it looks like, what it feels like, what it looks like in three dimensions, what it feels like. Um, texture is something you really can't get in a book uh, or on a video screen. Um, so actually being out in the field with the tree is the best way to get to know it. Uh, of course, in, during COVID, being well with someone is not always the easiest way to do things. So uh, uh, you may have to uh, try something else like visiting a site that has uh, trees identified with interpretive signs, such as a, a wildflower center or the Zilker Botanical Gardens. And if that doesn't work, another way to do it, it's the way I learned them, is get a good field guide and become familiar with it. Don't just take your field guide fresh out of the wrapper or out of the bookstore and right out in the field and see, and let's see what this tree is. Get familiar with the, the field guide first. Um, get familiar with what the trees are that you might see, how to tell them apart, and then go out in the field and see if you can see things that, that match up with what you find in your field guide. And I'm old school. I, I tend to like books still. Um, I realize iNaturalist may be the wave of the future. Uh, it's a way you can snap a picture of something and have somebody else identify it. I like to identify it kind of on my own. Um, but uh, a lot of the books that I list here uh, are references that I have used, getting familiar with the trees and shrubs and other plants in Central Texas. Um, a newer feature is the next to the last one, the Trees of Texas Identification Guide. That is online. It's a pretty good starter anyway. It'll take you through a key system to get to know trees. Um, it isn't comprehensive. It doesn't have all the species you're going to find in the hill country, but it will at least get you close. And even the species that are not illustrated are sometimes described. So you can at least then go check some other source to see, hey, it's, it, is this tree that's not illustrated on that site? Is that what I'm looking at? Um, the last resource there is not actually a field guide, not an identification guide. It is a website that, that gives you 
uh, some insight into a lot of botanical terms. And I'm going to be throwing a lot of botanical terms in here. I'll try to describe what I mean as I'm going through them, uh, but it helps to have that. And you might actually even want to pull that up. All you need to do is uh, Google leaf shape. Uh, and the first thing that comes up will be a Wikipedia glossary of leaf morphology that has a really handy chart. Uh, drawings indicating what a lot of these leaves and leaf shapes look like. Of the book references here, uh, the, the most accessible might be the first one. It has photographs. Uh, it's a good starter guide. Um, I, I have some issues with how uh, the author interprets the history of Juniper in Central Texas, but otherwise it's a pretty good uh, first identification guide. Uh, if you want something more comprehensive, you might want to work down the list. Um, Trees of Central Texas by Robert Vines is a really good, fairly uh, comprehensive guide, though the terms now are outdated, some of them. They've changed the names on a lot of these things, uh, but it is a good guide. And if you really want to get into the botany, uh, Schinner's and Mahler's Illustrated Flora of North Central Texas is probably the, that's kind of my Bible. Uh, uh, though it technically does not cover Travis County, um, it does cover 99.9% .9 of the, the species you'll find here, but it covers more than just trees. It covers all vascular plants, so that may be more than you want to, to, want to tackle at first. Okay, uh, into the trees. Uh, the first ones I wanted to talk about were the conifers. They're an easy, easily recognizable set of trees, and there are really only two of them that you can find on the preserve. Um, ash juniper, of course, everybody knows, also called mountain cedar. Um, it has those scale-like leaves that are pressed close against the twigs. Uh, the female trees will have the blue berries that are not berries, they're actually cones, uh, but I can't tell the difference. They look like berries to me. Um, the male trees um, do not have the blue fruit, but they do have the pollen, uh, the pollen cones that turn the trees orange in uh, the middle of the winter when they're pollinating. This, of course, is an evergreen. The other conifer in our area is called bald cypress. It's usually found along water courses. It needs a lot more water, um, deeper soils, um, and it's very different from juniper. It has soft, flat, needle-like leaves perpendicular to the twigs, and then the leaves and the twigs that they're on all, all fall off. The tree is deciduous. They all fall off in the fall after turning a rusty color. It's a pretty rust color before they fall. So these two trees, are, you should have no trouble telling them apart. The only other conifer you might find in the area would be Eastern Red Cedar, which does occasionally pop up on the, on the preserve. It's mostly a tree of east of Austin, and it's very difficult to distinguish between ash juniper. Uh, so I won't go into that right now. Uh, and it's fairly rare on the preserve, so you aren't likely to encounter it there. If we get outside of the conifers, I wanted to cover a few morphology terms just so you have an idea what I'm talking about. Um, most of the leaves that we'll be dealing with, or a lot of the leaves we'll be dealing with will be simple leaves, um, um, like on the top tier and on the lower left. Um, these are leaves that are not divided so dramatically that it looks like they are multiple leaves on one leaf. Um, but they can be arranged differently on the branches. You can have alternate leaves in the upper left, that's where the leaves are staggered along a twig, or they can be a pair of leaves at each point, at each juncture on the twig, and those are called opposite. Um, and then in the lower corner there, you sometimes have them so densely clustered on a short spur branch that you can't really tell if they're alternate or opposite. Some guides will refer to that as fascicled leaves, uh, or else they'll just say they're clustered on short spur branches. Um, in the upper right there, I also wanted to show you a couple of lobed leaves and the terms there. Those are leaves that are so deeply incised that it looks like they have little arms. Um, and then between those lobes, are they, the gaps in between are usually called sinuses. If the leaf is so drastically divided, if those sinuses get so deep, that they actually segment into different sections, then you end up having a compound leaf. And that's what we illustrate in the lower part. Uh, the lower right uh, twig there is a twig that has three compound leaves on it. 
and the area that's in the white circle is all of the green in that white circle is a single leaf. That's not five different leaves, that is one leaf. And each of the segments is called a leaflet. Each leaflet attaches to the rachis, which is kind of the branch that goes through the leaf. The rachis, I've colored green here to distinguish it from the woody twig. The rachis is deciduous with the deciduous leaves, if it's a deciduous leaf. Um, so, so the whole thing will fall. The leaflets can also disarticulate and, and fall separately, but the entire thing uh, is, comes loose. Telling a compound leaf, a leaflet on a compound leaf, from a simple leaf that's attached to a branch can be tricky, um, but the woody branch, the branch uh, is, is woody, it's persistent, it doesn't fall uh, in, in the autumn um, with deciduous trees, and it doesn't, it, it, it persists through the years. Um, the, uh, a compound leaf will usually can be taken apart from the twigs, separated from the twig fairly easily, even if it's, a, if it's an evergreen uh, compound leaf, but it can be tricky to tell the two apart. All right, moving on to some of the trees. You can't talk about trees around uh, the preserve without talking about oaks. We have at least seven species of oaks that can be found on the preserve, and they can be confusing. They will hybridize. They have variable leaves, um, so they can be confusing. Fortunately, the, there are three main species that we'll find on the preserve, and they fall into three different groups. And we'll start with the red oaks. Um, the most common one is the Texas red oak, as Jim was talking about, or the Spanish oak, Quercus bucklei. It has a classic oak leaf. Uh, if you think about a deeply lobed leaf um, that's your standard oak leaf, that's what a red oak looks, red oak leaf looks like, particularly the Spanish oak and the Texas red oak, or its close cousin, the Shumard oak, which is almost identical. Um, they, they have deeply lobed uh, leaves with U-shaped sinuses that go oftentimes more than halfway to the midrib. Um, the bark you can see over there on the left is fairly smooth for an oak. Um, it's often mottled, different patches of gray with lichens also on it. Sometimes it's called a spotted oak because it is that mottled appearance. And even when it gets to be a mature tree and the uh, bark starts to break apart in, with deep furrows in between, it still maintains those plate-like uh, tops of the ridges in between that have the mottled appearance. Um, so it's, it can be a fairly distinctive tree. The Schumard oak is very similar to it. Uh, I won't get into identifying those. I refer you to a guide on those. You may have to get a hand lens out to tell those two apart. Oh, going back the other way. Um, there is one other red oak that you may occasionally occur, uh, find on the preserve. It's called the blackjack oak. It has a leaf that is usually not as deeply lobed as the Spanish oak, although this one here is. Um, it has kind of what looks to me like a duck foot shape to it. Uh, it's very broad toward the tip of the leaf, and it's usually fairly shallowly lobed, like the lobes in between the toes of a duck's foot. Um, the bark, unlike that of a Spanish oak, is very dark, and when it breaks into, when it uh, gets up to be a mature tree, it uh, breaks up into squarish blocks that do not have that uh, pale gray uh, plate-like uh, look to the tops of the ridges. Aside from the red oaks, there are also the white oaks. Now, the white oaks uh, are represented particularly on the preserve by the shin oak, also called scaly bark oak. The leaves look very similar. They're very variable. They can have almost no lobes at all or they can be lobed about as much as the Spanish oak. The difference is that the lobes are blunt. They're obtuse tips. Uh, they don't have a sharp point and they don't have a bristle tip. All of the red oaks have a bristle tip, which is the vein that's extending out beyond the tip of the leaf. Um, the, the white oaks, including shin oak, have um, rounded lobes instead of that bristle tip, and that's an easy way to recognize them. Shin oak is also recognizable easily because of the very thin, pale gray, scaly bark. It's easy to pull off 
uh, strips of that bark with your hand. Um, and it's very recognizable in that way. It's also a fairly small twisted tree, but it can get to be a full size canopy tree, 12 inch diameter or more. Um, almost always you're going to find it root sprouts dramatically. There are a lot of uh, uh, suckers that occur at the base of, that grow up at the base of the shin oak. And it oftentimes will be just that, a shrub, or it can have a single trunk or multiple trunks growing out of that shrub. Uh, it's a very easy way to recognize shin oak. And it helps to recognize it from its cousin, another white oak called the post oak. Post oaks aren't real common on the preserve. They tend to like sandier or deeper soils. Um, it tends to be a large tree. It doesn't sucker like uh, a shin oak, or at least I haven't noticed that. Um, the leaf is, is very variable, like with the post oak, or like with the shin oak. Um, but it, a classic post oak leaf is cross-shaped. Um, and the lateral lobes, about a third of the way back from the tip, are kind of square-like. Uh, they, they are almost as broad as long. In some cases, like on this leaf, they're about as broad from side to side as they are long from the edge of the leaf out to the tip. Um, so that's a distinctive characteristic of post oak. The bark is also pale gray, and it can be scaly just like shin oak, but it's usually thicker. Uh, but that may not be en easy enough to tell them apart. The third group of oaks are the live oaks. And live oaks don't look like either of the other two oaks. They are not lobed leaves. Their leaves are entire. Um, they are smooth edged. That's what the word entire means in botanical terms. Um, they don't have lobes. They don't even have teeth. They're just, they're just really smooth edged, usually elliptical or oblong in shape. Um, they may have a smattering of, of hairs scattered over the surface, but that's about it. Um, they're evergreen. They're alternate like all oaks. The, the leaves are alternate on the twigs. Um, the base is usually rounded. Um, they, seedlings may have some spiny teeth around the, the margins of the leaf, um, but otherwise they, they don't have any, any uh, indentations on the edges at all. Uh, the bark is dark and it's deeply furrowed uh, when it's mature. Um, the, Oaks in our area are assumed that they're all plateau live oak, um, um, but the coast live oak that grows on the Texas Gulf Coast and throughout much of the that's the oak that has the Spanish oak, uh, the Spanish moss draped branches around the plantation homes. That's coast live oak. It's nearly identical. And between the coast and Austin, they hybridize. Uh, so um, it's not always possible to tell for sure which species you have. And some botanists think that it's all one species. And Plateau Live Oak is just a, a variety of the Coast Live Oak. Uh, a way you can tell the difference, maybe, if you have purebred of both of them, the acorns of Plateau Live Oak are long and narrow. Fusiformis means spindle-shaped, which doesn't mean a whole lot to us now unless you happen to have a spinning wheel still around, but it means a, a cylindrical and rounded at both ends. Um, it tends to be much longer than it is broad. Uh, Coast live oak tends to be squat, about as broad as it is long, and I've got acorns of the two right there. Um, the leaf shape is also slightly different between the two, but again, because they hybridize, it can be hard to tell the difference. Because a live oak leaf is relatively uh, common shape, um, there are a lot of trees that have that. There are a lot of things that can be confused with it. I'd like to look at a couple of those now. Uh, here are two here that uh, I frequently will have to do a double take oftentimes to tell between, uh, until are not live oaks, and particularly when you have seedlings. If you have a seedling or, or even a very young sapling, live oak, it can look very much like either of these two species. Gum bumelia, also known as woolly bumelia, woolly bucket bumelia, gum elastic, chittimoid, it has more common names than any other species in the central Texas. And it's a very variable tree. It's usually small and spindly, kind of like a shin oak. Um, but it does have, um, it has, the leaves are oblanceolate. That means they're 
They're long and spatulate shaped. They tend to be much wider toward the tip than they are toward the base um, compared to more elliptical, evenly uh, shaped uh, leaves of a, of a plateau live oak. Um, they also have a tendency to be congested on uh, small spur branches like you can see in the photograph right here. Um, the, uh, this, these are classically fascicled leaves. Um, this is what they look like when um, this is characteristic of gumbomelia. It's also characteristic of some of the cherries and the, and the plums, other members of the rose family. Um, but that is one way you can tell gumbomelia apart from live oak. But probably the most reliable way to tell is that the leaves are downy underneath. They have a soft fuzz, uh, short hairs uh, that cover the underside of the leaf. Live oak does never have that much down on the underside of the leaf. So if you just rub your finger underneath a, the leaf of uh, a, a plant you're not sure of, uh, you can easily tell the difference between gumbomelia and live oak. Gumbomelia also will occasionally have long spines that could be up to an inch long. Uh, but not all of them have that. Um, another look-alike is Lindheimer silk tassel. This is usually a shrub that can grow very tall. Um, the leaf is usually broadly elliptical, um, not much longer than it is broad, with a rounded or obtuse tip. It also is downy, at least below the leaf. So that's an easy way to tell both these species from live oak. Another way to tell this one from live oak and from Amelia is that the leaves are opposite. Um, they, they grow uh, where one leaf connects to the stem, there will be another one on the opposite side of the stem. This one does not have spines. It is evergreen like live oak, um, unlike uh, Gumbomelia, which is, eh, it can hold leaves late into the winter, but it usually does drop them. So those are two that are very similar. A third one that can be similar, if you don't have the mature trunk, is Texas persimmon. Um, Texas persimmon, if you have a mature tree, it's pretty obvious. They have that pale gray bark that, that peels off to reveal an even paler underbark, um, and it's a very distinctive tree. But if you have a young tree uh, where you can't see the bark easily, then the leaves are your best, best uh, or a good way to tell them apart. You can see in the upper photograph there, um, the leaves are oblong, uh, the side maybe tend to be parallel uh, um, or elliptical. They're very much like a live oak leaf, usually more blunt tipped. And a very characteristic feature is that the sides curl down. They curl under. Um, I'll sometimes see that on a live oak. I will never see that on a silk tassel or a bromelia, uh, but it is very characteristic of the Texas persimmons. The underside of the leaf is also usually downy, uh, like some of the other uh, look-alikes. If you're lucky enough, of course, to see the fruit, the fruit's a dead giveaway. It's about the size of a quarter. Um, green at first, but turning black, as you see in the lower center photograph. Uh, very sweet and juicy. Uh, the flowers in the spring are also distinctive. They're very small, though. You have to look for them. Only like about a mm, quarter inch, half inch long, and white bell-shaped flowers. Uh, the bees love them. Um, so if you don't have the flowers or the fruit though, you're going to have to rely on the leaves and the bark. Moving on to another common canopy tree you'll see in the preserve is escarpment black cherry. Now, escarpment black cherry also has simple leaves, but unlike the live oaks and all the other species looking at, the margins of the leaves are toothed. And you can see that in the lower left photo. Their sharp indentations um, look like the, the serrated edge of a knife along the edge of a, of a black cherry leaf. The leaf, the leaf also is fairly smooth on the top surface um, and glossy. Off the, and the veins are not very prominent. Only the mid vein is really noticeable. Even on the underside, the mid vein is, is um, prominent on the, on the underside of the leaf but most of the side veins are just kind of plain on the same plane as, as the leaf itself. Uh, that is important in distinguishing some of its, its relatives. Uh, the bark of the cherry is really distinctive. It's smooth, kind of a wine-colored bark, um, peels off in horizontal strips, 
And then you have these little horizontal pale protrusions called lobes that are very distinctive to uh, the cherries, prunes, or cherries, plums, and other members of the rose family. Um, there are some other trees, some like, like uh, flame leaf sumac that can also have lenticels, um, but they don't have that wine colored bark like the cherries and the plums. Um, when it gets older, that bark uh, becomes scaly, blackish, and it looks like burnt cornflakes. That actually is something that can help you recognize it because it looks like burnt cornflakes. Uh, if you're lucky enough to see the flowers when they bloom in April, they're in long clusters called racemes, um, very elongated white flowers. Um, and they don't produce a lot of cherries, they're usually just a few cherries produced per cluster. Um, they are about the size of a pea and they turn black when they're ripe. They're mostly pit, they're mostly sour, but the birds love them. Black cherry also has some lookalike species. One of them is a close cousin, the Mexican plum. Now, Scarpment black cherry is usually a canopy tree, frequently canopy tree. Mexican plum rarely gets very tall. It's, it's about 15 feet tall at most. Um, a characteristic, it has a broader, bigger leaf than, than uh, cherry, but it also most distinctive is the surface is dull and wrinkled, and that's because the veins are recessed, uh, or on the underside, they're raised. So you have a network of veins on the underside of the leaf um, and they're recessed on the top side that gives it a wrinkled appearance. Uh, very different from the smooth, glossy appearance of a black cherry. Um, the bark is very much like a black cherry's bark. It's thin, peels off in horizontal strips. It does have lenticels, so they're not usually as distinctive uh, or not as obvious. Um, the white flowers that occur before the leaves, uh, usually in February and March, um, are in a compact cluster, unlike the elongated cluster of a black cherry um, that uh, the flowers occur in black cherry in April, long after the leaves are already on. And the fruit is a nickel-sized plum. Down in the lower right there, those are not ripe. They ripen to a purplish-red color. Um, and um, again, they are edible. Um, and very distinctive if you see them, but I don't see a lot of production from a lot of Mexican plums. Another lookalike species is the rusty black claw. Uh, now this is not a cherry or a plum, and one difference that easily distinguishes it is that the leaves are opposite. You may be able to see that on the red leaves in the lower right corner, that there's a pair of leaves on opposite sides of the twig. Uh, the cherries and plums all have alternate leaves, so that's a quick identification between the two. Um, the leaves are kind of intermediate between black cherry and Mexican plum. The veins are fairly prominent, but they don't give a very wrinkled appearance to the leaf. Um, and the leaf is not really glossy. It can be glossy, as you can see in the, the photo that has the flowers, uh, but it's not always as glossy uh, as a black cherry. Um, it gets the name from the rusty hairs that sometimes you can find on the underside of the, the leaf, the main vein, and the leaf stalk, and the buds. Um, I had difficulty finding any to photograph, um, so there aren't, it's not something I would rely upon a great deal. Um, black cherry can also have rusty hairs along the, the, the mid vein on some, in some cases, so it's not that reliable but it is how it got the name. The flowers are in dome-shaped clusters, bright white, very showy when they occur after the leaves come on in March. So they kind of intermediate again between the February blooms of Mexican plum and the April blooms of black cherry. The fruit, if any survives the birds, um, is kind of oblong. It's about twice the length of a black cherry fruit about the same width, um, a bl dark blue color with a waxy whitish coating on a red stalk. Very colorful combination between the two. And you can see here, it looks like the birds have already hit this one. They're already picking it apart. Okay, on to another common tree that you'll find. This is a potentially a canopy tree, especially in floodplain areas, but you can also find it on uplands. And that's the hackberry. 
Um, hackberry trees have a uh, very distinctive bark and the bark is the easiest way to recognize it. Uh, of course, you need a mature tree or even a fairly old sapling to be able to see the, 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 the warty, uh, corky protrusions on the bark. It can be a smooth gray bark with just a scattering of corky warts. And they're not warts, of course, they're just they're, uh, uh, protrusions of bark. Or those uh, warty ridges can form, those warty protrusions can form ridges. Um, and I see that there's, there's two different uh, varieties I've shown you here. Uh, and I don't think that varies by species. I think it just depends upon that particular individual and what it shows. Um, if you don't have a mature tree, if you have a small tree, one of the best marks for a hackberry to notice is the asymmetrical base of the leaf. And you can see that on that center right photo, the one that has the little warts on, on the leaf, the, very, the base of it is lopsided. Um, it's not even on both sides. You can also see it somewhat in the upper left photo, uh, though it's somewhat obscured by shadow there. And it's more of a truncate base. It's cut straight across, but at an oblique angle with the leaf stalk. Uh, it's not a, a, a 90 degree angle, it's cut at an odd angle. Uh, that makes the leaf look lopsided. Even on the heart-shaped bases of the upper right photograph, uh, you can see that they're not quite even. That's very distinctive for the hackberries. Uh, another feature of hackberries is that they're really prone to uh, being uh, in, infested by oak gall or oak gall wasps. They will lay their eggs uh, on the leaves and the leaves will form a gall around the egg, uh, protecting it until the uh, wasp uh, larval, larva hatches. Um, this is particularly very common among hackberries. You'll see them very often. Um, so if you see a, a leaf that has some sort of warts and wart looking appearance, uh, and they may not look exactly like the ones I photographed here, then hackberry is a good possibility. Um, again, here the leaves are alternate on the twigs. Um, they tend to be longer leaves, a uh, longer shape than the, ch the cherries uh, and the other species we were just looking at. Um, there are either one, two or three species of hackberries in the Austin area, depending upon what botanist you talk to. Um, I think the current uh, uh, wisdom is that there are three species, uh, but they tend to overlap. The best uh, uh, way to tell them apart is that sugar hackberry, which is more common to the east, has a smooth upper surface to the leaf. Net leaf hackberry, more common to the west, has a sandpapery surface very rough. Uh, Lindheimer hackberry is intermediate between the two, so I'm not sure. It's somewhat rough, but not as rough as dent leaf, I guess. Um, apparently the leaf stalk, whether it has hairs or not, is an among the three species. Um, but generally I would think the net leaf hackberry would be the one that's more adapted to the limestone, more arid soils of uh, the hill country. And so if you're planting, you have a choice between the two, a net leaf hackberry would probably a better choice. Close relatives of the hackberries are the elms. They're in the same family. They also have the lopsided uh, leaf base, so it's not as easy to tell on smaller leaves like many of the elms have. Um, the most common elm in our area is cedar elm. And unlike the hackberry, it does not have a particularly distinctive bark. It is very variable. As you have the two examples here, they can be deeply furrowed or they can be scaly. It's generally a pale gray brown, but uh, the texture is very variable. Um, young uh, cedar elms will often, not always, but often have corky wings along the twigs. This is a good way to identify cedar elm, distinguish it from either of the other two common elms in our area, because neither of the other two has those. The leaves themselves are sharply toothed. They're so toothed that they're often double toothed, so that each tooth has a little notch or more on the side of it. You can see that illustrated in the lower left photo. That's a tooth that has a little 
notch on the side of it, and that means it's double toothed. Some of those teeth on that leaf there look like they're triple toothed. Um, it is a way to tell Cedarum. Uh, it is regularly double toothed, but a better, a more reliable way to tell it apart from the other elms is it is scabrous on the surface, which is sandpapery rough on both sides of the leaf. So if you rub your finger over the leaf and it catches like on sandpaper, it's probably a cedar elm. Um, in the lower center is, um, is a photograph of the seeds of a cedar elm. Um, cedar elms uh, have seeds that are called samaras. Um, they are disc shaped or elongated and they have papery wings that surround the seed. I'll turn that light back off again. Um, um, and that's distinctive to elms. Only the elms have a, a, a papery wings surrounding the seed like that. Two of the other elms in our area are the Chinese elm it's not native and it is becoming an invasive species. Um, mature trees are unmistakable. The papery bark, gray-brown bark, peels off to reveal a, a, a patchwork of orange inner bark. Uh, no other tree has a, a, a trunk quite like that. But if you have a seedling, it can be very difficult to distinguish from cedar elm. Um, the tip of a, a, of a Chinese elm leaf is, tends to be more pointed, acute. Uh, as opposed to more blunt tipped, but there's some overlap there. It tends not to be double toothed, though I have seen some Chinese elms that had double toothed leaves. The best, the most reliable way to tell it apart is that the leaves are smooth. So if you run your finger over uh, the surface of a Chinese elm leaf, it won't catch like it will on a, on a cedar elm. Um, the twigs of saplings and seedlings never have quirky wings for a Chinese elm. So if you have those wings, it's definitely a cedar elm. The other elm is American elm. It has much larger leaves. They're usually at least three inches long. Um, the tip is sharply pointed to long pointed. It's also called acuminate. That's a botanical term for a long pointed leaf. Um, cedar elm blooms and produces seed in the fall. American elm produces uh, flowers in late winter, January. Um, so it's one of the first trees to come out in leaf or flower. Um, it also has really deeply furrowed bark, as you can see with the inset. And this is one of the few trees that I would actually say the shape of the tree can be indicative um, because it tends to branch from near the base and the, the, the large branches tend to, to gracefully curve outward in a vase-like shape. That's very distinctive for American elm, though you can't always see it. Moving on from the elms, we're going to go into some of the compound leaf trees. Uh, first of these are the ashes. The ash trees have, uh, this is a compound leaf, you can see in the center photograph there, all five of those parts of the leaf there, those are all leaflets, and that is all one leaf. And you can see where that leaf attaches to the branch, there's another leaf on the other side, they are opposite. That is a key feature for identifying ashes distinguishing them from the other compound leaf trees. If you are lucky enough to see the seeds, the seeds are called are also samaras, like with the elm, but unlike with the elm, the wing is or the papery uh, wing attached to the seed is strap shaped and it's attached only to one end of the seed. So when you have a cluster of ash samaras, it looks like a, a, a bunch of keys. And they're oftentimes called keys. Uh, so that's one way you can always recognize an ash. Only ashes have that kind of samara in our area. The bark is narrowly ridged and dark, uniformly narrowly ridged on all of the ashes. The ashes can be difficult to tell apart. The most common one that we have in our area is Texas ash. Um, it has a tendency to have rather roundish um, uh, leaflets. Um, that they're not much uh, longer than they are broad. Uh, they may have a short tip or they may be rounded at the tip. Um, they may be a little whitish colored underneath, but that's not that consistent. This is a tree that's more often in uplands. And there's usually the number of leaflets is usually five. It can be seven, but five is a typical number. Compare that to 
two of the three of the other ashes that can be found in this area. Green ash is the more common native. It is found along rivers and streams. It likes wetlands. It usually has seven leaflets, though my example here has only five, and they are much longer than broad, uh, usually more than twice as long as broad. Uh, the twigs are downy compared to the smooth twigs of the Texas ash. The tip is, tends to be a little bit longer, more pointed. The base is more tapered. It's not whitish underneath. Um, um, and compare that to the Arizona and Berlandier ashes. Uh, Berlandier ash is a South Texas shrub, a South Texas tree that barely ranges into the Austin area. Arizona ash is found in West Texas to Arizona. It is not native to our area, but is commonly planted here. They're very difficult to distinguish between those two species. They have tended to have rather narrow leaflets, um, narrower than even the green ash, pretty sharply toothed, usually at the upper margins, usually five leaflets compared to seven for green ash. Um, and they're often planted again in, in urban settings. Um, I showed a key there because uh, uh, a Samara, because it tends to be, uh, they can be triangular in cross section which is different from the others. Uh, another compound leaf tree that is very similar to the ashes is the box elder. Uh, it's also called ash leaf maple because of its similarity to the ashes. Um, it's also pinnately compound. Um, the leaves are opposite on the twigs and, and they can have three, five or seven leaflets, but they are jaggedly toothed. The margins are very dramatically toothed and often lobed so much so that they can easily be confused with poison ivy because poison ivy often has the same appearance. But poison ivy has alternate leaves. This again has opposite leaves like all maples and like the ashes. Another key feature that helps to identify it is that the twigs are usually green, a bright green. That's the woody tree, the twigs, not the, the, the leaf stalks, but the twigs themselves are bright green, or they can be purplish, and that's the lower photograph that you see, lower left. And then if you get lucky enough to see the seeds, they also have samaras, samaras uh, like ashes, but they are paired, um, consistently paired. This is typical for the maples. And so if you see uh, the keys, you can easily recognize a maple, and if it has a compound leaf, then it's a box elder. Okay, moving on to, we've been dealing with um, opposite leaved compound leaves. Um, now we have some, also some leaves that are alternate and those include the walnuts. As you can see, the upper right photo there shows the leaves attaching to the twig alternately. Um, they have long leaves, many leaflets. The leaflets are toothed, they're not jaggedly toothed, but finely toothed, but they're obvious in the hand. Um, the bark of the tree is deeply fissured and dark. And um, what else am I going to say about that? The seed, well, of course, the seed is a walnut. Um, it is in a globular fleshy rind that has to decompose. It doesn't split apart. It has to decompose or be rubbed off and the, the nut that is left behind has a ribbed shell. That's different, um, different from the pecan, which we'll look at in just a second. There are you know, at least... Yes. Oh, I hate to cut in, but we're reaching the end of our time, and I wanted to make sure we um, could get a couple questions in. Okay, uh, I'll finish this slide, and we'll get a couple questions in. Okay. All right. Um, Arizona walnut, little walnut, and black walnut are the three species in this area. Arizona walnut is the most common. Um, it's also the one that has the fewest leaflets of the, of the three walnut species and about the mid-size of the nut. Um, close cousin to the walnuts is our state tree, the pecan. It's actually in the hickory group, a hickory genus. Um, the, they have nuts that dehiss. Um, they are, they, the hull splits apart and the nut when it emerges is smooth on the margins. It doesn't have the ribs and so it's easy to tell the nuts apart. The leaves are a different matter. Um, the walnuts tend to have the largest leaflets in the middle of the leaf. The pecan has the largest leaflets are the terminal leaf, leaflets. 
uh, and you can see that on the illustration here. Um, but a caution, um, the, the tree I photographed with the, the pecan with the nut here, I looked closely and some of those leaves there had the largest leaflets in the middle of the leaf. So definitely a caution with that. I have a great deal of difficulty myself telling pecans from walnuts. Um, the nut is the one sure way to tell, um, but sometimes the sh uh, size of the leaflets and their placement is a way to tell them apart. All right, uh, we're only a couple species here left. That's Western Soapberry and Flame Leaf Sumac, but we can leave that for uh, another time. All right, do we have any other questions? Great, thank you, Bill. Yeah, we have a few questions. So um, this question is from Tom, and this was came with um, Jim's talk. But uh, as a last resort, perhaps for a struggling restoration plan, are invasive species or genetically modified species ever considered? Sorry, just in the live here. Uh, invasive species, uh, no, we, we tend to pull the invasive species out because by nature they're pretty invasive. Um, we may uh, take our time about doing it depending on what function they're playing until we can replace them with something better, so. Great, thanks Jim. Um, and then one more for Jim. What does um, fungi contribute to the soil forest community that bacteria does not? That's from Daryl. Oh, oh, thank you Daryl. That's a good, good question. <laughs> well, the uh, Fungal community, especially mycorrhizal fungus, uh, attaches to the roots and it's, it's basically kind of an extension to the root system going out. So they're actually collecting uh, nutrients uh, farther out than the roots are. Uh, so it's, uh, and also they're connecting with other trees in the area and that's where the, the term wood wide web comes from is that the fact that underground there, there's a whole network of communication going on. Great. Um, so Daryl has a question for Bill. Bill, I noticed that Texas persimmon often has small bumpy galls on the leaves. What's that about? I think you may have touched on that with the hackberry. That's a good question. I do not know. I assume again, it's a gall wasp, but I am not familiar. There are many different species of gall wasps. Um, I believe most of them are host specific, uh, but I don't know if they're very well studied yet. Um, there, there, have been, uh, there have been some studies of some of the gall wasps in Texas, but I do not know how thoroughly they've been studied. I don't have an answer for that. And then Christina ha asked, why do we get lots of blooms but no fruit on their Mexican plum? I do not know the answer for that either. Um, I will say Mexican plum has a tendency to get more fruit than a close relative. It's also occasionally occurs in the, in the area. It's more of a shrub called Creek plum, uh, Prunus rivularis. It almost never produces fruit um, from what I've seen um, in, in the, the one thicket that we have that I know very well on Kent Butler tract. Um, but uh, Mexican plum does produce fruit. It's just very infrequent, and I don't know why that is. Thank you again to everyone for joining us, and we'll look forward to hopefully having you all join us for the next um, presentation on November 2nd uh, about tree planting. All right. Thanks so much, Audrey. Right. Thanks for everybody. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.